and welcome to Washington Talk. I'm Eun Jung Chao. President Trump and Chairman Kim agreed to resume working level talks during their dramatic DMZ meeting. But North Korea recently warned the U.S. South Korean military drills will negatively impact the planned talks. Why is North Korea avoiding the working level discussions? of course, to resuming those uh, negotiations, and we hope to talk about all ways that we can advance progress. Time is not of the essence, but uh, I think good things will ultimately happen. In the studio with me today, Ms. Jean Lee, director of the Korea program at the Wilson Center. Ms. Lee is an award-winning journalist and was the first Pyongyang bureau chief for the Associated Press. Also joining me, Mr. Scott Snyder, director of U.S.-Korea policy program at the Council on Foreign Relations. His latest book, South Korea at the Crossroads, charts the evolution of South Korean foreign policy and strategic choices. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Hi, great to be here. Now, Jean, let me begin with you. So, North Korea says that the planned military drills may jeopardize the resumption of the working level talks, but Secretary Pompeo said that Chairman Kim at the DMZ actually committed to putting together his working level group, working level meeting group within the several weeks. So, why is North Korea not keeping Chairman Kim's promise? I see this as North Korea seeking some leverage as they go into any negotiations at the working level. So I actually see this as somewhat of a, a good sign that they're getting ready for those negotiations. Well, I shouldn't say it's a good sign. It's always, it's always negative if North Korea is using threats and coercion and pressure to try to gain the upper hand. But this is very much part and parcel of the pattern of behavior that we see from North Korea. You know, it's not a country that necessarily keeps its promises or negotiates uh, at face value the way that other countries do. Uh, they use threats and pressure to try to gain that upper hand. Mm -hmm. And um, Scott, so um, North Korea is saying the United States is reneging on President Trump's promise at the Singapore and at the DMZ regarding the military drills. And Secretary Pompeo said that actually the United States is doing exactly what President Trump promised. So why do you see there is a gap between the perceptions? Well, I think that uh, all we can go with is what Secretary Pompeo has said about what President Trump has said. The North Koreans are saying something different. I think they're using the military exercise as a pretext uh, I think that their position has become more rigid because they see the United States as over eager to get to talks. Uh, and so the rigidity actually stimulates a debate here among different watchers uh, about uh, what the U.S. should do. Uh, and that is a debate that the, that the North Koreans can benefit from because they'll take the most flexible opinions uh, that have been given on the U.S. side and make it part of their position. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that it is a pretext, but look at the timing. The military drills were already announced. Dongmeng 19-2 was already announced back in March. Why is North Korea suddenly taking issue with this drill right before the working level talks? Well, I think it's an excuse to push, to, to buy time, essentially, uh, and in order to put pressure on the U.S. And so what's really interesting is with regard to these drills, this is an issue that I think properly now belongs in the context of the inter-Korean talks uh, based on the comprehensive military agreement where they already made some understandings about uh, not doing drills near the DMZ. Uh, and so I think this is an issue where South Korea should be in the lead, but now the North Koreans are raising it uh, as a pretext for avoiding nuclear discussions with the U.S. And so I think this is part of North Korea's typical playbook, trying to divide and conquer. 
uh, and trying to drive a wedge between the U.S. and South Korea. I did want to make one point, which is that we don't actually know what President Trump promised Kim Jong-un in Singapore. We weren't in the room. And we don't actually know precisely what he promised on military drills. And North Korea knows that. In a sense, they're taking advantage of the fact that there's some discrepancy within the U.S. administration, some discrepancy in our understanding of what they promised. The U.S. side has made adjustments to the training regime. Uh, over the winter training cycle, cycle, we saw no reciprocation by the North Koreans. Yeah. And so that suggests to me that uh, this is an issue that they want to press on. Uh, they're trying to use it uh, because ultimately, from a North Korean perspective, any exercises are part of what they can characterize as a hostile policy yeah. uh, that the U.S. has toward North Korea. Yeah. And so essentially what they're doing is saying, we want more and we want it on the front end before we get to talks. And so that's part of the usual pattern yeah. of demanding concessions prior to negotiations that we've seen. So going back to North Korean thinking, Chairman Kim was shocked at the collapse of the Hanoi summit, and that's because he miscalculated President Trump's patience. So is he, again, miscalculating President Trump's patience by delaying the working level talks? I do think he was surprised at how quickly President Trump walked away from the negotiations in Hanoi. The working level negotiators did quite a bit of work in, in establishing what each side would give up, but they left the main discussion about denuclearization and sanctions relief to the two leaders. And I do think Kim Jong-un was prepared to sit down with President Trump for a bit longer, um, but perhaps did not realize that President Trump was coping with a domestic issue, which, were, which was, was testimony by his former lawyer that certainly he stayed up all night to watch. So he wasn't in any mood to negotiate. Uh, and I do think that he learned from that. Um, whether or not he's miscalculating here, actually, I think that the meeting at the DMZ um, earlier this month uh, was something that not only gave him a face-saving way to get back to these negotiations, but also put him in a position of strength. And he knows now that he's a bit, he's got a bit more opportunity to be bolder in pushing back at the United States. And that's what we're seeing right now, that he's saying, actually, I'm I've got a little bit of the upper hand right now, and I'm going to um, hold you at bay. As Scott mentioned, it's a way to gain some leverage in these talks and stall those tricky discussions mm -hmm. about denuclearization. Mm -hmm. I think Gene is absolutely right on this. And really, you know, let's think exactly about what happened. Um, Kim Jong-un uh, was in a position of weakness post Hanoi. And what President Trump did by meeting him at the DMZ was to allow Kim Jong-un simply to come out to his front porch, greet President Trump, and erase that failure uh, as a narrative uh, domestically in North Korea. And so this was a tremendous gift, but I think it's made Kim Jong-un overconfident now because he has the relationship to rely on. Uh, he thinks Trump has his back. Uh, and so whatever else happens in negotiations, I think that's where they're focused. Mm -hmm. Secretary Pompeo, for the first time, mentioned that we need to have the security assurances that the North Koreans need in place. And South Korean media are speculating that the upcoming working level talks will discuss now the security guarantees for North Korea. Do you also think is that the security assurances will be on the agenda in the working level talks? Security assurances have already been part of that working level discussion. They were discussed before Hanoi. What didn't happen was, at that summit, was an agreement that they would um, implement all aspects of what the U.S. administration has called the four pillars, which included some security guarantees, included discussion about declaring an end to the Korean War, uh, more work on retrieving the remains of soldiers whose bodies and remains are, are still in North Korea, um, discussing the establishment of diplomatic relations with a liaison office in Pyongyang. I do believe that these are things that have been under discussion. Uh, but when it came down to it in Hanoi, Kim Jong-un just wanted to talk about sanctions relief. So I do think that uh, what Secretary Pompeo is referring to echoes the work that the United States hope they'll be able to complete in the next round of negotiations, is getting those security assurances uh, on paper, as well as denuclearization. So I think the security assurances are something they've been discussing, but they haven't been able to put that on the table 
in addition to denuclearization and sanctions, really. Mm -hmm. Secretary Pompeo said North Korea should come up with new ideas to the table. What kind of new ideas is the United States looking for? I think the main thing that uh, Secretary Pompeo was referring to is that we want the North Koreans to come prepared to talk about denuclearization. Uh, and so the really interesting question, I think, is whether or not a shift from focusing on sanctions relief to focusing on security guarantees uh, represents uh, a, a step back for Kim Jong-un to actually frame this in a way that allows us to get to some kind of agreement. Uh, as Gene suggests, I mean, these other issues of liaison offices and steps toward peace were already there uh, as part of the negotiations. Uh, but I think those were the things that the North Koreans knew that they were going to get or could get. Uh, or is talking about security assurances actually just in another way of pointing to the uh, hostile policy of the U.S., uh, which is the fallback position uh, that North Korea leaves itself the arbiter or judge uh, of whether or not the U.S. has fulfilled as a way of just continuing to draw out additional concessions from the U.S. side. Mm -hmm. And President Trump said that time is not of essence and that he is absolutely in no hurry. Why do you think he mentioned the time element here? I think President Trump imagined that the North Korea issue would be the centerpiece of his foreign policy. I think he believed when he started on this path that it would be an easy foreign policy victory. He's realizing it is far more complicated and far more difficult. And so he's focusing and recalibrating how he's going to frame this as a victory. And so he is thinking about how this will affect his re-election campaign in 2020. Uh, and so I do think that he's keeping that in mind and recalibrating the language and trying to figure out what he can claim as a success. I want to say, though, that Time is of the essence. It's the North Koreans who don't have time. We look at the reports from the United Nations and from other um, aid groups that point to drought conditions, the food shortage, the impact of economic sanctions on North Korea. So Kim Jong-un doesn't have that much time, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Now, Scott, um, Senator Tim Kaine told VOA that um, at some point, we have to say they're not going to denuclearize and we have to decide what to do. Ambassador Chris Hill told VOA that North Korea's hypocrisy means Trump administration must reconsider the entire process. So is the frustration growing in America regarding this diplomacy? And are we at that time to have to reconsider the entire process? Frustration is growing. I think that's very clear. And a lot of it is a result of the way that uh, U.S. Uh, observers are viewing uh, North Korea's stalling tactics, uh, along with the repeated assessments by intelligence community representatives that North Korea will not denuclearize. And so then the question becomes, what is the objective of the policy and what do we need to do in order to make progress? And so there is, there is frustration, uh, but then the question of uh, plan B or the alternatives, I mean, in a way we had that debate back in 2017. Uh, and I'm not sure that the alternatives look any better now. I think that's the reason why, in some sense, President Trump opted for a process which enables us to extend the time frame necessary to achieve a solution. Uh, plus, I think in Congress, uh, they're thinking of Plan B as not going back to military instruments, but really applying the economic pressure. And so we can continue to see a drumbeat of uh, trying to ratchet up economic pressure uh, as a way of driving uh, North Korea back to negotiations. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll have to leave it here and now watch video for our next discussion. Violations of human rights in the DPRK constitute crimes against humanity, the gravity, scale, and nature of which has no parallel in the contemporary world. Just because of my aunt father-in-law was a Christian and my cousin's whole family were executed because of their sharing gospel. Bring that up. So, I, yeah. understand, I understand exactly yeah. what you're saying. I'll bring it up. Mm -hmm. 
At the Religious Freedom Ministerial, Vice President Pence pointed to the North Korean regime as the world's worst prosecutor of Christians. He vowed to continue to stand for religious freedom on the Korean Peninsula, even as President Trump continues to pursue denuclearization of North Korea. Now, Scott, in U.S. foreign policy, how important is it to um, advocate the core values like religious freedom, and how much of, of this is a priority for the Trump administration? I think the Trump administration is making it a priority uh, of the administration writ large by having, for instance, the conference that was just concluded, second annual conference on religious freedom. They're sending that message uh, abroad, but when it comes to the issue of direct negotiations with North Korea, uh, I think that uh, the human rights and religious freedom issues have actually been bracketed from the issue of the relationship. And so we see that President Trump himself talked a lot about uh, human rights in 2017, but uh, since he's developed this special relationship with Kim Jong-un, uh, we don't see an emphasis on that so much. So I think that it was really interesting that we saw um, the North Korean representative uh, in the Oval Office uh, raising these issues, and President Trump said that he would take that to Kim Jong-un potentially, but we really don't know what will happen. Mm -hmm. So Gene, do you think President Trump will raise this issue in meeting with Chairman Kim and him meeting with Chu il -yong, the North Korean defector in the White House, would this impact the denuclearization talks? I don't think so. Picking this issue for, on the human rights front is interesting. If you really wanted to tackle the big issues on human rights, you would, you would raise the question about the political prison counts, uh, not religious freedom. I think this is one where the White House sees an opportunity to touch on human rights without uh, really hitting a nerve with the North Koreans. And this is an interesting one, because this is one where North Korea can push back and confidently say, actually, we allow all of our citizens to practice uh, their religions. We know that that's not true, but it is written and protected in their socialist constitution. So it's one where the North Koreans, I think, will feel somewhat comfortable pushing back. They also have churches in North Korea. Both Scott and I have been to churches in North Korea. And so they can use those to show, actually, we do allow people to practice religion. So I, I might be a little bit cynical, but I see it as an area where the White House can say, look, we are addressing human rights and we're going to bring it up but they know that it's not going to touch a nerve with the North Koreans the same way that discussing political prison camps will. Mm -hmm. That but, may be mm -hmm. true, but I think that there is probably, aside from denuclearization, there is probably no more intractable issue in the U.S.-North Korea relationship than an issue like religious freedom, precisely because uh, there can be in North Korea uh, no higher um, calling than political loyalty to the leader. And freedom of religion raises the question of the aspect of North Korean life that North Korean authorities cannot control, and that is what are North Korean people thinking. And so this really is, I think, a direct threat and an area where the U.S. and North Korea uh, are diametrically opposed. Mm -hmm. On that point, Jean, um, Kenneth Bay, former American detained in North Korea, also joined the ministerial, and he said okay. that um, North Korean authorities, while he was in captive, he told, North Korean authorities told Kenneth Bay that they consider religion as the most dangerous weapon to the country, and that the North Koreans are more afraid of people like Kenneth Bay who bring in religion to the country rather than the nuclear weapons of the United States. So what do you make of it? I do think that the fear of foreign influence is very high. It's something we need to keep in mind that the North Korean regime is very scared that foreign influence will be a threat to the Kim family holds on power in North Korea. And that's why they maintain such repressive control over the people's access to outside information. I think it's something we need to keep in mind um, in the United States as we, we, we've seen Secretary Pompeo talk about wanting a better future for the North Korean people, and I applaud that. Um, however, we need to keep in mind that the North Koreans are going to be very wary, I should say the North Korean regime will be very wary of economic engagement that threatens the regime's hold on power. Uh, it's a very tricky balance, I think, between um, reaching out to the outside world 
and not allowing in too much foreign influence. So we're going to start to see some of the contradictions and the tension in that balance going forward. Mm -hmm. So Jean mentioned about the bright future after denuclearization that U.S. is promising to North Korea. Would this bring about some sort of religious freedom to the country as well? Well, I think that our idea of what a bright future means and the North Korean idea of what a bright future means, I mean, frankly, there have been no details provided uh, on that. And I have a feeling that uh, negotiating the definition of bright future could be almost as difficult as negotiating the definition of denuclearization. Uh, and I'm quite sure that uh, the North Korean leadership is going to continue to try to uh, bound uh, influences uh, of outside uh, thought, including religious thought. Interestingly, they have accepted uh, things like the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology, uh, but it's very clearly within uh, bounds, and we know that that university is filled with people who people of faith who are going to North Korea with the desire to make change in North Korea, and yet they've accepted that, but it's within bounds. And so it's, I think, totally about whether the leadership believes that uh, the influence is controllable. Mm -hmm. So, Jean, last question. So you've been to those Bungsu Church in North Korea. Do you think there is any meaning in having those fake religious practices in North Korea? Would, would that also lead to some kind of religious freedom in the future? It's interesting. It's very hard when you're at church in North Korea to tell what's real and what's not. Uh, the church does serve as an example of, I would call it inter-Korean cooperation. You know, the Bibles, everything in the church is provided by South Korean churches. It's all South Korean. So, in a sense, even if you call that a propaganda showcase or uh, just theater, uh, they're exposed to South Korean practices. The North Koreans who are in the church are exposed to South Korean religious practices, also South Korean materials. All of the hymnals, everything was South Korean. So it does, in a sense, expose them to a religious culture outside their country. I do think we should recognize also that Pyongyang was called the Jerusalem of the East. It does have a rich Christian heritage. We had American missionaries in Pyongyang for many, many years until the end of the Japanese occupation period. Uh, and so that is a part of their heritage. And it's also a part of the Kim family heritage. Kim Il-sung's family was Christian. Kim Il-sung went to church as a boy. And so it's something that they that is, they can acknowledge as part of their history, even as they see it as a threat. And, and the church, with any of these projects like the churches, I do think it's an interesting experience when you go there. It's very hard to tell what's real and what's not, but I also am mindful of the fact that there is a group of North Koreans in this church exposed to this religious practice, exposed to the fact that this is how things are done outside the world. And there's yeah. something interesting to that as well. Very interesting. We'll leave our conversation here and now move on to our next segment. Okay. Now time for the photo moment. Time to look at an interesting North Korea picture. Today we have a photo of a hot springs resort at the Gyeonggang Mountain catering to North Koreans and to foreign tourists. North Korea is receiving foreign tours to Mount Gyeonggang from July to November. In Mount Gyeonggang, there are 80 locations where propaganda slogans are engraved in huge letters on the rocks praising the leaders. Jean, what's your reaction? I've been hiking in Mount Gyeonggang. Scott probably has been as well. Um, it's an, an incredibly beautiful place, but it is always striking when, you, when you're hiking and you see these massive propaganda slogans carved <laughs> into the side of, of the mountains. I think that, uh, you know, I think that the North Koreans are getting ready for the potential or the possibility of inter these joint inter-Korean projects that really did serve as a cash cow for North Korea. Um, they're ready for them to be resumed. Uh, I'm curious, did you, did you make a trip to Gyeonggang yes, before it was closed down? I did. I've also been to Mount Gyeonggang, and I would say that uh, you know, the, the natural beauty is there, but it's also uh, the propaganda statements are etched into stone. Uh, and uh, it's going to take thousands of years for wind and weather to wear that down. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a very complicated picture, I think, because um, it is a very attractive tourist location, uh, but um, it also uh, serves uh, as an instrument by which to uh, signal who the North Koreans think is in charge of that domain. Well, 
That's all the time we have for this week. Mr. Snyder, Ms. Lee, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this was Washington Talk from the Voice of America, and I'm Eun Jung Cho. Join us next week for more analysis on North Korea. Thank you.